Please turn your Bibles to Micah, the sixth chapter. And we want to look at verses 6 through 8. Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He that showed thee, he has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The text that we just read, has been considered to be one of the most uh, comprehensive of the Bible regarding man's service to God, man's relationship to God. It is so full of all-embracing matters pertaining to godliness. Another would be one probably more familiar with. Ecclesiastes 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. But I like it where he raises the question. What does the Lord require of you? Micah answers this question. That's an inspired question the prophet had. And in so answering it, he makes some very important points that will be very apropos to your life and my life in being faithful to God and the Lord's church. But we first want to note, what did God send this prophet to Israel at that time to say these words? Why did he do so? What was the situation? Then we want to, in the second part of the sermon, Note the benefit these words are to Christians, to the Lord's church. Keeping in mind the application as taught by Paul in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So as we seek to understand and answer the question, uh, inspiration had Micah raised to Israel of old, what does the Lord require of you? We want to consider the question as it applied to Israel. What did the Lord require of fleshly Israel under the law of Moses? No, that was the way they approached God. That law was for them and them only. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. Moses would say there that this law was given not to our fathers, but unto us, even us who are all of us alive here this day. Some possibilities, maybe even some of those being considered absurdities, might have gone on in the head of an Israelite. Now remember, except for technology, language, etc., they're just as much human as you are, and they see things in their daily lives just like we do. They experience them. But they approach God under the law of Moses. They didn't know anything about the Lord's Supper. Not one thing. They didn't know anything about baptism for the remission of sins. They knew that they worshipped God they understood he was but one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. We know that. They know that. Paul declared the same in Ephesians 4. There's one God, one Father of all. 
But yet they approached him under the law of Moses. We don't. They did. That was how they saw God. They loved him. That was how they demonstrated their faith and confidence in him and his ability to preserve them and keep them for what he chose them to be. Year old calves is burnt offerings. That's mentioned in this passage. Thousands of rams. Notice 10,000 rivers of oil. That's a lot of oil. And he's not talking about the black crude. <laughs> offering of the firstborn, which had nothing to do with the offering as the pagans did of burnt sacrifices of their children to their false gods. And you need to study the Old Testament to understand how God wanted the Israelite family to understand the significance of the firstborn in the family. Well, there's some observations I would like to make here. Remember, the question is, what does the Lord require of you? And we're answering it as it had to do, as originally given, to the Israelites. And he spoke of these things. I mean, this is nothing new when the prophet enumerates these things. They understood very well in the worship, the Levitical priesthood, and the offerings and so forth about these things. Because he spoke of them in Levit Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. They had offerings of calves and rams. However, as I said, the absurd amount of oil and offering of the firstborn are examples of all we can say is examples of hyperbole. Is that what we say? But no, hyperbole. John's laughing because we heard a preach. I think he was there. I'm not sure. But we heard a preacher go into a great elaboration on the importance of understanding hyperbole <laughs> in interpreting the Bible. So hyperbole, if, uh, by the way, if you don't learn anything else, you learn the difference in hyperbole, hyperbole. <laughs> uh, hyperbole is used in literature for the sake of emphasis. Emphasis. They called a bass big as a whale. Well, that's the day how big the bass was. But it tells you from that man's viewpoint that caught it that it's a very, very big bass and not run of the reel, a meal. For from the context, again context, who's speaking, what's being talked about, who's being spoken to. So from the context, it appears ritualistic sacrifices. Now, there's nothing wrong with ritual. Nothing wrong with, the, with ritual at all. When we observe the Lord's Supper, we're going through a ritual. What the problem is here and what Israel had was that Ritualistic sacrifices alone does not please God. You can partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine and never think about what they are emblematic of. You do so, you haven't worshipped God in spirit. You may have gone through the motions, that's the way we would say it nowadays, but that wasn't worship of God. You can't please God by simply offering innumerable sacrifices, even if they're very precious things as far as you, the worshiper, is concerned. Even when you're going through the motions. Remember, and I noticed in John's prayer, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's not worshiping God in spirit that's accept acceptable. It's not worshiping God in truth that's acceptable. There's a reason that conjunction is between spirit and truth. It takes both. There is a difference. You leave one out, you have worship God. It's like saying, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, I was baptized. Did you believe in Jesus? You're not saved. You say no. Well, I believed in Jesus. Well, were you immersed in water by his authority for the remission of your sins? No, then you're not saved. It's belief plus baptism equals salvation. So it is with our worship and really anything else we do in life. 
Paul even enumerates in great detail in that wonderful passage in 1 Corinthians 13 on, on love, agape love. He says, I, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profited me nothing. So attitudes do make a difference. Reasons we do things do make a difference. Our disposition of mind toward what we're doing does make a difference. For religious rituals properly ordained of God to be accepted. Now watch, this is an obligatory thing. No escaping it. They must be accompanied by other things just as essential. Well, what did God require of Israel? To do justly. To do justly. That's a mouthful said in very few words. What does it mean to do justly? It simply means to act toward God and man according to the divine standard of righteousness revealed in his law. Thus, fleshly Israel could do that as the law of Moses reveals such conduct. A law defined as a rule of action. A simple definition. I know how to say it. A law is a rule of action. I think you'll be hard-pressed to find God acting without rules of action. A lot of people need to think more about that even when it comes to the work of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, in dealing with man. Because some of them have him acting in all sorts of ways and not even make any sense. But I don't think the Holy Spirit ever has worked because he's deity. Oh, man, outside of law, outside of a rule of action, one person, a divine person, dealing with created persons, human beings, he's always dealt with them. So is the Father and the Son, so that the whole New Testament is summed up in James 1, verse 25, as the perfect law of liberty. Now under the law of Moses, being just, involved the offering of sacrifices commanded by God. But it also involved treating their fellow man in a way that was right. Let me ask you this. How do you know how to treat your fellow man in a right way? Now you have a hard time, even the youngest of us who paid any attention, to anything we've been taught, the little classes all the way up, Bible classes, not to have it already, it's engraved on our heart to an extent of, of what it is that God requires of a person to treat another person in a just manner. But failure to do justly was one of the main reasons Israel went into captivity. Just read the great prophet Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 through 14, and chapter 8, 16 and 17. And as the old saying goes, that's what the good book says. So we want to be a people, as God wanted them to be under the law of Moses, doing justly toward God and man according to the divine standard of righteousness that's revealed in the law of Moses. Again, we're seeing, what did the prophet do sent specifically to Israel and why to fleshly Israel? But then the next one is the law of mercy. Do you love to get your pound of flesh, especially on somebody that deserves it? And have we not been known at least to think, you got just what you deserve, bud. I don't want to get from God what I deserve. Now, this doesn't mean it's all on the person that needs to be merciful. There must also be the disposition of heart of the one that's the sinner, the one that's wicked. This ties in with the idea, and it comes up all the time. It'll always come up. It's come up all my life. It will for the end of time. Can we forgive somebody when they won't repent? Simple answer. No, but I don't have to hate them either. If I were to ask you, tell me where in the Bible... 
God has revealed that he will forgive somebody who does not repent, where would you go? Old or New Testament? Get an answer. You, it's not there. God stands ready to forgive every sin any man ever committed. As long as they're still alive on this earth and accountable for their actions. But they've got to have a disposition of mind that says, I have sinned. My fault. I'm not going to do like umpteen people do. It's your fault. I sinned, but it's your fault. Or, it's my fault. Yes, but you know all the help you gave me. You know, there's all that stuff. Adam tried that. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't blame it on a coconut. So he had Eve. Only living human being there. The woman now gave me. She didn't give me and I didn't eat. That's in you and me both to say when we made a mess of things to try to drag as many people into the whirlpool going down, down, down as we can. I don't know what comfort there is. I really have never understood what comfort there is in saying we're all going to hell. Isn't that fun? I never, this is etched on my mind, and I may have used it at another time, but when my daddy's youngest brother, the baby of the family who made a career of the Air Force, was stationed in Tokyo, my grandmother, who was in her late, late 60s, maybe 70, decided she wanted to go to Tokyo and see him. She always made a trip to see him, whether it's by train or whatever else once a year. So she decided she wanted to go over there. Well, he's the baby of the family. I don't care if he's how old he is. Babies of the family are babies of the family. <laughs> so, um, that you know, that's what makes an only child so scary. <laughs> well, that's the truth. That's what we have to look out <laughs> But uh, she let him know she's going to Japan. Well, now what made that even more horrible? Long her oldest son, my daddy's oldest brother, was killed by kamikaze planes off Okinawa. And at that point, it hadn't been 20 years before that, but she was going to see him. Now, say all that led the background. So she starts, and of course, they, they go up that northern route around by Alaska and down Tokyo. She got back home. After spending a month, I guess. And the two sisters that lived in Camden all had pitched a fit anyway when she was bad, yeah, going fine, your age, blah, 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 blah. And then she said this that will forever tell me about human nature the way we are. Were you scared? Well, it got kind of rough up when we were around Alaska, it bounced a little bit, and I kind of got a little nervous. And then she said, well, then I thought, well, if I go down, everybody else is going down. And said, so I felt all right then. Now, I, I probably wasn't but about 13, 14 years old. And that stuck with me all this time because I couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> well, the Israelite was like that. Lord, the Lord, Lord Moses, thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Well, I wouldn't even follow one to do evil. God doesn't excuse you for following one's example that's a bad one. Well, why would he say don't follow a multitude? It's easier to go with the crowd. That's why. That's the reason fellowship's so important. And fellowship with the right people. So to love mercy. Well, this means to show a compassionate, warm-heartedness toward man. And we need that. Not only treat others fairly, but to show mercy when mistreated themselves. Prime example. Father, forgive them. Well, they don't know what they do. Stephen, lay not this into their charge. One reason they were to love mercy, and it's really the reason, is because God himself delighted in showing mercy. Do you, do I delight to show mercy? Here's a fellow that needs a knot on the head from the standpoint of the way the world looks at it. 
So they show him mercy when he recognizes his situation. I, over the years, I remember growing up, and a young man who was older than me, but not, he had not yet left home, I was probably 13, he had got into some bad scrape. And I remember he responded to the gospel invitation. And he came down the aisle and he just fell into his father's arms crying. Just broke completely down. You know, his daddy didn't shove him back and say, you've just done bad things to our family by your conduct. And get out here on everything. You. I never forget. I can see it now. Brother Yates' face. Had nothing but compassion and mercy for his son. Well, does that remind you of an account in the scriptures of the prodigal son? And that's God looking at mankind and those who say, I've made a mess of it, I did it, and I can't blame anybody else. If you'll just let me be a hired servant. The father saw him come and run, put a ring on his finger, clothed him. He was so happy to see him come home. Then to walk humbly with your God. And this involves living in humble and submissive obedience to God's desire and will. And of course, in the fellowship of the church, which we'll get a little more to in a minute, that means helping each other do that. It can only happen when we recognize the absolute holiness and righteousness of God. It's the humble of heart and the spirit and spirit that greatly pleases God. Isaiah 57, verse 15, and chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. Now that's the prophet to fleshly Israel concerning their living under the law of Moses and their needs at that time. But remember Romans 15, 4. Now, what does the Lord require of us as members of the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thus all Christians for all time? Well, we could think all the Lord requires is the observance of certain rituals, like attending assemblies of worship. But don't take this too far. I'm just saying what I said in the beginning. You have to worship God in spirit. And in truth. And thus some people, you know, come to church, go through the ritual, get your ticket punched, and you go to the next time to line up at the box office to get your ticket punched. And that's, I've, I've done it all required. I, I really wonder sometimes if people who do this, if they will really be honest with it, if they really believe it themselves. But that's the example they said. And almost the answer they give if you ask them every time. And again, let me emphasize, I would not take away at all from rendering obedience to our God and assembling his saints to worship God. That's why I started off saying, I, I missed when I've been sick. In fact, this passage since, since thank, uh, well, no, since... Halloween, you're going to mark it that way. I miss more services of the church that I have my life. I don't like it. And with this COVID-19 stuff, that's really put a damper on a lot of things. It is essential to obey God that we assemble and do as we're doing right now, engaging in all the five acts of worship He ordains for the worship assembly on the first day of the week, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Those assemblies are best described as, as assemblies of exhortation, exhorting one another to live righteous. And it's done through our worship in the five acts we engage in. And we haven't exhorted one another if we don't from the heart engage in the worship of God in those five acts. It's required if we expect to grow spiritually, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It's part of the way that we provoke one another unto loving good works. In fact, I'm persuaded that failure attend every worship assembly possible 
can certainly be displeasing to God when you have a choice. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. And most of the time we do. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes you can wish yourself to be able to be in place, but you just can't. I love to preach. I've never wanted to be anything else but a preacher. There are other things I've done that's sort of around the edges. <laughs> but I'm a preacher at heart. I'll preach at the drop of a hat, and I'll drop all sorts of hats. It's the reason I joked like I did, and I sat down in this chair, get me comfortable, and we may be here a while. I don't preach just to talk. Started a long time ago, and I think it's true of everybody that's a faithful preacher of the gospel, regardless of what else they're doing on the side. I wonder what was going through Paul's mind as he made tents. It's something that you're compelled to do. Jeremiah described it as a fire in his bones. And he got so discouraged, he said, I'm not going to speak anymore. And he said, the fire roared so much, he said, I cannot contain myself. I must preach. I tell you now, if you're going to be a preacher of the gospel and all the Bible defines a gospel preacher to be, whether you're supporting yourself or not, financially, secularly, don't preach unless you, you can't help it. Your Christianity and your service to God and your love of God and the brethren and lost souls drives you to preach. And preach because you have something to say, not because you're going to say something. Yes, we can be displeasing to God. When we don't attend the services. If something's wrong with our attitude and our thinkings we ought to be talking about. But do we really believe that our absenting ourselves when we have a choice from the worship assemblies is going to help me go to heaven? Is it going to help my brethren go to heaven? Is it going to cause God to say, oh, that's a wonderful thing? So this, this particular matter can explain the lack, the lack of several things. The lack of spiritual growth. The lack of interest in spiritual things. And by that I mean the things the Lord wants the church to do. And how to apply Matthew 6, 33 to your life. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The lack or the absence of commitment to the work of the body of Christ. The lack of close fellowship with God and those who love God and keep His commandments. So I'm convinced that it's essential that we observed what rituals, I put in quotes, God has ordained for us. But... The Lord requires far more than just, quote, assembling with the saints, unquote. And again, remember in the context in which I said that. So what does God require you particularly? What does he require me and every other faithful member of the church of Christ to do justly? That is, under the New Testament of the Christ to act toward God according to his divine law, Matthew 7.21. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? To act toward man according to his divine law. Paul deals with that the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 29. And one way or the other, a lot of places throughout the New Testament, as to how we deal with one another. Again, that great love chapter actually is dealing with that. Because you have all these gifts, but you don't have love behind them. And that was the days of miraculous gifts. What good is it to anybody as far as you are concerned, your own personal relationship to God? To love mercy, show compassion, warm heartedness toward man, toward widows and fatherless, James 1 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the widows and orphans and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James 1 27. And even, and Jesus had a lot to say about this in his earthly ministry, even toward our enemies, Luke 6, 35 and 36. Enemies who seek to destroy you. 
Enemies who would like to see this congregation turned upside down, wrong side out. I, I have literally had people, one claimed to be an elder, long years ago, who got mad at the church. And I actually said to members, not to me personally, they reported back to me when they went to talk to him. And I say elder loosely, of course, that's the position he occupied. That he was so angry at those things that went on that he said these are his words almost verbatim as it was reported to me. I ought to come down there and tear that place up. Man, there should have been an elder. He wasn't even a Christian with an attitude like that. But how do you deal with somebody like that? You pray about them. How do you pray about them? That they come to their senses. That they repent of their sins. Can you forgive them? No. Can you hate them? No. Just don't hate them, but pray for them. Be surprised how your mind will change. Not in the sense of saying that you dissolve them and absolve them of their responsibilities to repent and all that involves. But it means it takes the load off you. Folks, you and I are not responsible for every sin everybody commits in this world. We are responsible for doing what we can where we are. And that's enough. I'm not trying to lessen that. So even toward our enemies. And then to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. Now that's the only way, even though seemingly some of my more learning brethren and preachers have forgotten this, it's the only way to enjoy real biblical fellowship to continue cleansing, continual cleansing by the blood of Christ. James 4, 18 and 8, James 4, 8. And 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Such close communion and great fellowship with our Heavenly Father, with deity in general, requires daily listening to God, learning how to study the Bible, write the Bible, the word of truth, to study it daily, to meditate on it day and night, to hide thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee, to set my affections on things above, not on things on the earth. I don't know how to do that if I don't know my Bible. I don't know what it even means to do it. James 1, 21, 1 Peter 2, and verse 2. It means talking to God. I must be instructed in prayer. Jesus even left a model prayer. Much is said about petitioning Father. Praying for strength and forgiveness. I don't have to know how he does all those things as far as giving me the strength to persevere, but I, I don't worry about that. That's his business. I just do my part earnestly and steadfastly praying. Praising him according to his word for blessings receive Hebrews 4 14 through 16 Philippians 4 6 through 7 it's always easier to find pretty easy to find somebody like worse shape yourself I was laying on the couch the other day and I was feeling so miserable and I got an email from a fellow I'd known a long time ago you know anything about it I hardly know him much now I just I just came in contact but he was telling about his nephew Last January, he had a sinus infection. Got feeling bad. Wife tried to get him to go to the doctor. True to his manly form and husbandly attitude, he wouldn't. And a few weeks passed by, and he got up one morning, you know where he was. He was incoherent. Couldn't walk. Couldn't put a sentence together. Well, he had turned into meningitis. And after the surgeries and whatever else, and rehabilitation, he's sort of trying to come back. Lost his job. Wife lost her job because she had stayed taking with him. The government won't come and help because, you know, you have too much or you, don't, you should be even more of a pauper before you step in. And I thought, yeah, you feel bad, but you're not in that shape. <laughs> There's always somebody. And then there's a time, and I remember Brother Gus Nichols saying this because he was in his 80s when he said it. He said, everybody's always telling me how much they're praying for me and praying for long life. He said, folks, just pray God's will be done. He said, it may be God's will that I die tonight. And quit trying to tell God what to do. He knows what he needs to do. 
Just be humble. Walk before your God in close fellowship by knowledge and practice of the truth. And by walking humbly with God, we're more likely to keep in proper balance the demands to do justly and to love mercy. What do we conclude out of all this? Well, it's about as fundamental as you can get. Because it covers every facet of becoming a Christian and living a Christian life. Our rituals may differ, but it shows us that not only the doing of a thing is important, but the disposition of mind behind the one doing it when it comes to worshiping God and anything else we do to serve God. But it's still what it was with the prophet. What is our duty as spiritual Israel and you as a singular Israelite of God? Well, it's simple. To do justly. To love mercy. To walk humbly with our God. Now, if you're not doing that today, now's the time to start because you haven't got any other time. To believe in Christ with all your heart, that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and mean it. Complete your obedience to the gospel and becoming a Christian by being baptized to Christ for the remission of your sins. Let me tell you something. Any preacher that teaches other than that's a liar, and the truth's not in him. As it comes to, as it pertains to becoming a Christian. As a child of God, this was written to fleshly Israel. They were already children of God. What does it mean to us as spiritual Israel? Each one of us serving God. Well, it means this is the way you stay with it. What we've really said today, and then the lesson's yours, is a commentary. Commentary on what? Well, a number of passages. But it's a commentary on a passage I use most often. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain, the Lord. And then you can pillow your head at night and drift off and need a fitful sleep or a pleasant sleep. It doesn't make any difference. And it's all taken care of. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while you stand and sing.